Welcome. I'm Halcyon, and this is Hug Nation. Today, the topic is Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to dig into this because with all the confusing politics that are going on, this is one thing that to me is just clear. And it is something that I've had some evolving beliefs and understandings around recently. When I was in high school, I was super duper into rap music. We had um, integration through buses at my school, and so these guys would come on the buses and they'd bring these mixtapes, and I was just like blown away, in love. And so got really into NWA, got really into uh, LL Cool J, and went to a bunch of concerts, saw NWA in concert, saw Too Short. <clears throat> All those things, I was kind of like <clears throat> one of the... I was, felt like I was accepted in all those locations and all those scenes. Except when I saw Public Enemy. Public Enemy kind of whipped people into a little bit of a fight the power fury. And it became clear looking around that, that they may have been talking about me. And <clears throat> I should preface it by saying I grew up with a picture of my grandpa and Martin Luther King Jr. in my house. So I had this kind of sense of, you know, ancestral righteousness in, in me. And I just felt like I was one of the good guys. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, ended up doing, in, going to all sorts of concerts. In college, kept into rap. My rap name was Death Maine because I had long hair. And I learned a lot about you know, black history through rap music, through KRS-One and through Public Enemy. Actually, even went to go see Louis. Cer Louis I went to go see Louis Farrakhan speak after hearing him mentioned in a Public Enemy song. And you know, read Malcolm X and wore T-shirts with Malcolm X on it. And and I kind of eventually got to this point where I was like, you know what? The more I talk to people, the more it, I might be on the edge of being offensive more than helpful. And so I shifted my tone and, you know, realized that I am not a black rights activist. At best, I'm an ally. And so I toned it down and tried to, you know, at least provide environments where um, there was a minimal uh, racist element and maybe speak up if I heard a racist joke. But that was about it. And lately in the the, all the stories about Black Lives Matter, I've been kind of re-evaluating that stance of kind of taking a back seat and, and simply providing a safe space for people to assert their rights. Because there are really important ways for non-black people to be activists in a Black Lives Matter movement or in equality or to fight privilege. And, and I want to try to be more active in doing so. And it's really that idea of privilege. And, and it's the, the, as, it blows my mind when I hear people contesting the idea of Black Lives Matter, you know, contesting that there is some inherent inequality in our culture. It, I, growing up, had situations, like in high school, where a police would ask me to do something. I'd be like, what? You know, I had friends say, we pay your salary, you know, and things like that. And the cops were like, hey, guys, you know, hey, let's, uh, why don't you guys get home? It never crossed my mind that I was in danger. When I think about my nephews, my little blonde-haired nephews, it, I do not worry about them being shot by cops, being harassed, being accused of being a suspect just because they're in the wrong neighborhood. I don't, I don't give it one thought. But every black person thinks about that. Every black person that I've talked to about this has a slew of stories about times when they have been either harassed or mistreated or a uh, suspect or you know, given treatment where the first assumption is that maybe they're a criminal. Walked, you know, people walk behind them in a store. Um, and there's this 
you know, I used to think that, you know, the, the, the issue of racism had to do with opportunity and that absolutely it is harder for someone uh, without privilege advantages to succeed um, in financial ways, I'm saying. But, but recently I've become aware that it, it's way more than, than financial success and opportunity and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's this aspect of fear that is bred into the racial attitudes in our country. It is the, the, the attitude that if you are of dark skin, you need to cower before authority. You need to be not exercise your freedom of speech. You need to, you know, be, be submissive to the extent that you can to avoid possible brutality and know that you could be treated like we treat people, you know, we pull people without trial and send them to Guantanamo. We treat people with dark skin as if they're criminals without any sort of trial. And with these more and more videos showing up, we're getting more and more examples of people who have, uh, or, or we're getting visuals of this treatment in our face. So I, it blows my mind that, that there are people that are still fighting this as a concept or bringing up that all lives matter and not understanding that, of course, all lives matter, but <laughs> it is the black lives that are in need of protection. And so in terms of the, the privilege aspect, there was, um, I mean, excuse me, in terms of what we can do or what I can do, I've been reading a few articles and, and when situations come up where people are treating a person of color differently, it becomes very difficult for that person who's being mistreated to speak up because they sound angry or they sound militant or they sound like they're whining about the mistreatment. So in those situations where that is when the allies can do their activism. When you see someone being treated differently in line at the supermarket, you say, you call it out and go, how come you didn't check my ID when I bought that? You know, you, when you see somebody being lumped up in a, in a group, say, oh, th that person wasn't with that group. Because it takes the outside voice to sometimes be heard in those situations. So I'm gonna to try to be more active in that way. And um, as you know, I've talked in the past that I'm trying to be more and more aware of, um, of, of how I have uh, an unconscious bias, how I have un, like, I try to catch myself when I go, oh, like, huh, um, wonder what that guy does for a living. Like, did you just have that thought? because it's a black guy in a really nice car. Like, you don't think that when I see a white dude in a really nice car and, and trying to just challenge those stories in my head. Not that they're filled up with judgments, but they are, they're, they're patterns of thought that you know, have rippling effects to kind of just a sense of the world. And we live in a time now where, you know, the generations have gone far enough that you must assume that <laughs> There are, there are pockets of places where there's, you know, whites only and very few blacks. But you have to assume that we are integrated throughout the country. We have crossbreeding. We have brown babies, not black babies, not white babies. We have brown babies all over the place. And that is what is going to be the world. And the, those clinging to, you know, any sort of extremes on the edges are going to be the ones that are... Uh, the dinosaurs and the relics. So we live in a, this, this is one of the craziest times that I've ever lived in for sure. I'm not sure if anyone alive today would be able to argue with that statement. But I have hope that with this awareness, you know, I know that in myself, someone who I thought was a pretty evolved person have, has discovered pockets of, of racism in me over the last couple of years. And I continue to, to have to challenge that. So the fact that, you know, I'm going through it, I believe that many of us can be going through it. And the more that we interact with people and, and cross-pollinate in, in cultures and people, the more you lose the ability to make a judgment on ignorance because you get to know people that break 
the mold. If you have additional uh, suggestions on how to be an ally, um, I am very open to those suggestions, whether in the uh, chat here or uh, send me a message. Um, I, I recognize that we have some broken systems. We have some problematic stuff. You know, I, I look at every time I see police, police brutality and then that goes unpunished. You know, they, they catch it on video, it goes to trial, and then the, the, the consequences are minor or are non-existent. It freaks me out. I think about how angry someone must be. I think about how angry I would be if I was a young black man and I saw the world and the, the story that I would see is that I can be brutalized, killed, mistreated, persecuted, regardless of how I act. And then the police that do that to me, the power structure, as they abuse it, and as we catch them abusing it, we don't do anything about it. We meaning the United States. If I... What other options do we give people but violent revolution? I think the... When the I don't know the answers, but I know one of the biggest problems we have right now is the silence among police officers. Um, there, there's so many... I w I've never had an experience with a bad cop. Well, maybe that's not entirely true, but I think every 99.99% of police officers are amazing people doing incredible service. So why do those great cops cover for the ones that are doing shitty stuff? I know it's your coworker. I know it's what you're supposed to do and the, the brotherhood and stuff, but... For the sake of your career, your institution, for the sake of your own sense of righteousness, we have to create a culture where we encourage whistleblowing. We encourage people to stand up and, and we support those that do so. Because otherwise, you give people don't, no choice. If people march and you beat them, if you catch them killing someone and you don't punish them, what's my in incentive to not fight back in a violent, violent way? So I send out love to anyone who's being mistreated. I send out love to all those incredible law enforcement who are in this so difficult situation. And I send love out to all the parents who have little black kids and are struggling with how do they explain the world. Thank you. I love you. On behalf of Grandpa Caleb and all the Love Warriors, Happy Hook Nation.